be herself rather than merely being the product of her biological heritage and social environment. This is how Plato sets in motion the ongoing analysis of rational self-government, which we see in Stoicism and in modern philosophy, especially in Rousseau and Immanuel Kant, and which constitutes modern rational individualism. So Plato here is, in fact, at the origin of what Hegel calls subjectivity. Now, it's important, again, in Plato's case, as in Hegel, to see how value brings about a kind of being in what is guided by it, which is absent from anything that's not guided by value. Value brings about the being of what is fully itself, in as much as it's guided or determined, not merely by its surroundings, but by what speaks to its inner faculty of reason thus enabling it to be self-defining and beyond what is other. And this, I suggest, is why Plato, like Hegel, views the ideal as having more being than what's merely material or phenomenal. The forms, as summed up in the good, the form of the good, are what guide the being that becomes entirely one and thus is in a way that a mere collection of parts is not. What guides, and in that sense is the source of the being that becomes entirely one, must presumably be at least as much as he or she is. This is how the forms get their standing as having more being than mere appearances. They get it not from the mere fact that they're permanent, but rather from the fact that they guide what becomes entirely one, and what thus is more fully than its parts are. This intimate linkage between value and a higher degree or greater intensity of being is the basis of Plato's and Hegel's critiques of imperialism, positivism, and materialism. When empiricism reduces our knowledge to the flowing into us of data, that originate outside us, empiricism fails to recognize in which, the way in which the inner faculty of reason itself brings about a self-determining higher degree of being, which we know through direct acquaintance because we sometimes accomplish it and thus we are it. Materialism, by denying the independent role of thought, likewise fails to recognize this higher degree of being that we accomplish and are. Thus, the ascent, the upwards motion on which Plato and Hegel both focus, and the conception of a more intensive kind of being which this ascent makes possible, constitute a single illuminating alternative to the empiricism and materialism that were emerging in Plato's time and that dominate philosophical and public discussion, though not without challenge, in our own time as one would hope that philosophy would do, Plato and Hegel actually resolve the fundamental problems of knowledge and value, which empiricism and materialism appear to leave unsolved. The failure of empiricism and materialism to solve these problems generates the tendency towards skepticism and nihilism, both about value and about knowledge in general which regularly accompanies empiricism and materialism and which we see throughout our public discussions in uh, society in the last couple of centuries. Contrary to the frequent allegations of empiricists and materialists, the Plato-Hegel idealism is in no way anti-scientific. If anything, it's super-scientific. No scientist wants to believe merely what her senses or her instincts cause her to believe. Rather, the scientist wants to believe what thought, what her thinking identifies as most real within that flood of inputs. Plato and Hegel are encouraging scientists and thinkers in general to pay full attention to this thinking on which they rely so heavily 
and to give it for playing the central role in determining what they themselves achieve and are, and thus what the world as a whole achieves and is. It's not merely that star stuff, as Carl Sagan called it in his famous television program, it's not merely that star stuff has reached the point in us of knowing what star stuff is. It's not merely that the universe knows through us what the universe is. Rather, the universe has reached the point through us of asking itself what's true, what really is, and being guided by this question, rather than merely by its physical and chemical interactions as such. And by doing this, the universe has begun to constitute beings that are self-governed and thus have a more intensive being than mere stuff as such can have. In science, the natural sciences and science in general, the universe has lifted itself up to a higher degree of being. Thus, Plato and Hegel hold up the practice of science as a model of the most intensive kind of being. The most intensive being is guided by truth, and thus it's fully itself, rather than being instinctive or mechanical, and thus determined by what's other than itself. By bringing out this ontological effect of science, Plato's and Hegel's observations constitute what might appropriately be called a super science, a science of science and science's consequences. Note that I'm not saying that the more intensive being that the Platonic tradition identifies guarantees our knowledge of the external world. Neither Plato nor Hegel is much concerned about how we can have reliable beliefs about the phenomenal external world, although they don't doubt that we can have such beliefs. Rather, they're concerned about how we can know what truly or fully is, which is, according to their argument, the world of self-determining infinite freedom. And their answer is that we know this world by sometimes <coughs> being, being this world. Um, how are we doing for time? Should I, should I skip or should I... I could skip something. Two pages to go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So, by celebrating the sciences as instantiating a more intensive reality, Plato and Hegel also show how the sciences are inherently integrated with the arts, ethics, and religion. <clears throat> Beauty and the arts are evidently ways in which a new freedom, and thus a higher degree of being, begin to emerge from our instincts and our sense experience. Plato in the Phaedrus describes poetry as a God-given madness precisely because of the partial freedom and thus the higher degree of being that poetry achieves in comparison to mere appetite satisfaction and self-centeredness. Thus, the dispute between philosophy and the arts, which Plato famously brings to the foreground in the Republic, this dispute overlies a deeper agreement between them, which Plato alludes to in the Phaedrus passage in which Hegel and other philosophers celebrate. Likewise, ethics parallels beauty and art in going beyond appetite satisfaction and self-centeredness and producing a higher degree of being. And finally, religion takes our experiences of science, beauty, and ethics and interprets them as manifesting a more intensive reality than the reality of finite things as such. 
Since Plato and Hegel have shown us that there is indeed a higher and more intensive reality than that of finite things as such, religion is quite justified in interpreting science, beauty, and ethics in this way, provided that religion does not insert a new kind of finite thing, such as an anthropomorphic god or gods, as the pos supposed possessor of this more intensive kind of reality. Religions began unselfconsciously as a kind of poetry celebrating certain finite things for what seems to be their special aura of infinity, and only gradually realizing that all finite things possess this aura, inasmuch as they all achieve some degree of unity or selfhood and thus transcendence. In this way, religion gradually goes beyond idolatry and anthropomorphism. And in doing so, religion increasingly looks like philosophy, and vice versa. Philosophy increasingly looks like a kind of religion, insofar as both of them seek an appropriate relationship to the highest or ultimate reality. When we understand the resulting unity of religion and philosophy, we see how knowledge is ultimately indistinguishable from faith, when knowledge and faith are both properly understood. Both of them differ from everyday common sense finitude, so they both encounter resistance in everyday life. People make fun of religion and people make fun of philosophy. <laughs> Foolish nonsense. But insofar as they both seek what really deserves to be described as the highest reality, they are the same thing. They're both engaged in the same effort. Now, religion agrees with science and the arts and ethics and philosophy in that they are all ways in which we rise above our merely finite and mechanical interaction with our environment to a more intensive being. By showing, this, showing us this, Plato and Hegel show us how the major features of human culture are essentially in harmony with one another rather than in competition. They appear to be in competition, science versus religion, philosophy versus the arts, etc. They appear to be in competition only insofar as advocates of one of these features claim that it's the sole root, the only root to the higher truth or reality. But such a claim, as we know from previous discussion, renders the speaker unfree because he or she is simply rejecting and placing herself in opposition to something else and thus not is not being fully self-governing or free. So such a claim cannot represent the final truth or reality that it claims to represent. Insofar as in this way science, religion, art, ethics, and philosophy all contribute to a single self-determining and infinite reality and we know this reality directly by participating in it in these various ways, it's reasonable to say that we know the one ultimate reality. Thus, Plato and Hegel vindicate knowledge, ethics, the arts, religion, and philosophy, each of them properly understood, explaining how none of them needs to fall victim to skepticism or nihilism. By knowing this single self-determining and infinite reality in which we participate, we also know ourselves, who and what we essentially are. For it's only by participating in this infinite self-determination and thus being infinite that we can be fully selves at all by being fully self-determining. In this way, Plato and Hegel show us how to obey the great Delphic, the injunction of the oracle at Delphi, to know thyself. The fact that our self-knowledge has such far-reaching implications is perhaps the most awe-inspiring feature of Platonism. 
Now, of course, it's true that Plato doesn't articulate this entire picture as fully as Hegel does and as fully as I have. But Plato provides most of the materials with which the picture is constructed, and it explains features of his thought that are not explained by other interpretation, in particular his doctrine of higher degrees of reality. So it seems reasonable to suggest that Plato probably had something very much like this picture in mind, and that he should get a major amount of credit for it, along with the later thinkers, especially Aristotle, Plotinus, Plotin, and Hegel, who articulate aspects of it in greater detail. Thank you.